Yeah, Dr. Miki Bendor now. It says right here. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, I would like to thank Aaron for inviting me and to giving me the chance to give this talk and to be present in this uh, wonderful meeting with wonderful people. Uh, I started my presentations in uh, Boston in 2012, where I presented a paper that was just published called Man the Fat Hunter. And uh, this paper was based on a finding in a site called Kesem Cave, 15 minutes drive from Tel Aviv, where teeth of a human that was not supposed to be there were found. So uh, these are teeth of a hominin that is very similar to Homo sapiens. At that time, Homo sapiens was believed to have evolved in Africa 200,000 years ago, and this, is, this site is 400,000 years ago. So uh, later it was discovered that uh, Homo sapiens actually appeared 300,000 years ago, but this is still 100,000 years ago. Before the appearance of uh, Homo sapiens in Africa, you find a hominin that's very similar to Homo sapiens in the Levant, in, in Israel and its na neighbor area. And uh, that needed an explanation, and I had one. <laughs> so so uh, the explanation was, and it was associated this 400,000 years ago, uh, elephants disappeared from that area from the Levant. And uh, so if you tie the two uh, phenomena together, you can say uh, uh, that maybe because of the extinction of the elephant, which was the main source of food for the previous hominin, Homo erectus, that was there, because it was found in all the sites of Homo erectus in this area, uh, were found uh, uh, elephant bones. Uh, then, uh, so if, if, if the animal, uh, this human had to hunt now smaller animals, uh, of course it takes more energy to hunt smaller animals than large animals. So you hunt, uh, uh, you hunt once, and then you can live off a, a, an elephant for a month or two. Uh, but if you hunt smaller animals, you can only live for a week, let's say. So you have to hunt many more animals. So energetically, you have a problem. And uh, so uh, in order to overcome this problem, you have to become more efficient in hunting smaller animals. And one way to do that is to do tracking. Because if you track an animal, you are not dependent on randomly encountering that animal in the environment. And tracking demands a lot of brain power. Uh, you have to remember, you have to know a lot about the nature, uh, species, how they behave, Etc. Etc. In order to do tracking, and uh, so and that uh, need uh, uh, to make you mean to make decisions, very very quick decision under pressure uh, when you do when you do tracking. So you need a large brain. That was the explanation. There are other things that uh, Homo sapiens have uh, morphologically, etc. That can also be attributed to the need to be more efficient energetically. Uh, in hunting smaller animals, but I won't go into it. So everything is based, why, why humans were dependent on large animals? The idea is that since humans can uh, metabolize protein to energy only to about 35% of the uh, energetic requirements, uh, then th th they have to actually get 65% of their, of their energy from either carbohydrates or fat. So if they have, on the left-hand side, if they can obtain 50% of the energy from plants in the form of carbohydrates, they only need to get 15% in animal fat to complete the deal. Uh, and 15% animal fat, if you now just look at the animal itself, that 15% of, of the total becomes 30% of the animal. So if you have animal with 30% fat, you can get 15% of the total 
Uh, you just have to believe me. It's a little difficult, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, and 30%, uh, finding animals with 30% is no real problem. Most animals have 30% fat. Although, during dry seasons, the fat content goes down, so it becomes a problem. But normally, uh, the database that I had showed that uh, smaller animals have 30%. However, if you can only get 30% of the total energy from plants, you're in trouble. Because then, you need to get 35% of the total energy that you need from animal fat. And if you take just the animal, it becomes 50% of the animal calories. So you need animals that contain 50% fat, and there are not many like that, and they are all large animals. So really, depending on, on, on the availability of plants, uh, you may be dependent on large animals. And that was the idea that large animals disappeared. You became dependent on, on them for fat, so you had to get fat from smaller animals. Uh, you could only exploit part of the animals sometimes, etc., etc. so energetic pressure on humans that was alleviated by evolution. I'll skip that one. So a, a, a crucial question is how much plant food was available? And this was the subject of my next uh, presentation in uh, Atlanta in 2013 that unfortunately was taped but never, yeah, went somewhere the in the sky, yeah. So uh, anyway, uh, I had to go not to archaeology. So, though I studied archaeology, actually the answer of how much plant human ate is not in archaeology because Plant matter don't preserve. So you come to an archaeological site, prehistoric archaeological site, mostly what you find is the stones and bones. Uh, and it doesn't really tell you anything about uh, the level of plant. So let's start to call it trophic level. So the higher the trophic level, the higher the animal uh, portion of the diet. So you can't say what the trophic level was uh, uh, relying on, on uh, archaeological. So I took, other, I took clues from other areas, uh, scientific areas, and uh, took out a long story short because I don't have time. The conclusion was that we had a highly carnivorous diet during the Paleolithic. Paleolithic. Uh, the next uh, presentation, which was uh, five years later, in the meantime I managed to do a PhD, uh, was given in Bozeman. Montana, and actually it was a continuation of that same theme of looking for how much, how much plant, or what was the trophic level. Although at that time, I also dealt with the curse, I would call it, of ethnography on trying to reconstruct the trophic level. So if you ask uh, uh, any paleoanthropologists today, most of them actually, and not maybe all of them, they will tell you that humans were very flexible. Wherever the plants were available, they ate plants. And, and in the north, they ate uh, more, more uh, animal, and there was no problem during the Paleolithic. But, and by the way, Lorenko didn't have a lot to do with it because that was his conclusion. But my, my, my uh, uh, argument is that Recent hunter-gatherers are a bad, bad model for, for uh, Paleolithic hunter-gatherers, and for two reasons. One is the technology. Yeah? So recent hunter-gatherers use dogs. They use bows and arrows. Both of these uh, technologies actually only were acquired during the last 2% of prehistory. So they did not exist for most of the prehistory. Both of them help you hunt smaller animals. Uh, Hadza, which is serving as a model for, for many, in many, many paper, they actually use uh, metal for about 500 years already. Have been using metal as, as, uh, uh, for containers and for, for uh, arrow tips. So technology-wise, they're a bad model, and the environment is completely different. We cannot even start to imagine 
the difference between the environment in the Paleolithic and today. So this uh, top picture is the Ngoro Ngoro crater. And you see that there's very little vegetation. Most of it is uh, grasses and many, many animals. And this is the environment in which human evolved. At the bottom is a picture that I took two weeks ago when I visited the Adza. And the, the landscape is completely different. There's no room for small animals. There's no grass. And whatever grass there is, it's taken by cows that neighbor herders bring into the Hadza territory. So of course the Hadza, on the other hand, you see a lot of uh, vegetation which provides uh, uh, plant uh, food. They go around, I went with them, they go around and they pick berries. Now these berries are nothing like what we eat today, but uh, that's how they feed. They feed on berries and they feed on, uh, on other fruits. Uh, roots, but, but, so in any case, we published a paper at, at 2020 and sort of summarizing why the ethnolog ethnographic record is a bad uh, model for the Paleolithic. And then a uh, few months ago, we published another paper, and this time together with uh, Rafael Sertoli, that some of you may know, and uh, he was in charge of the biological side of it. We're really summarizing the, the findings regarding the trophic level of humans with the conclusion that didn't change is that Homo genus, so Homo sapiens, or Homo erectus before it, were actually hypercarnivore during most of the Paleolithic, only starting to eat more plants towards the end of the Paleolithic, so the last 2% of the, of the Paleolithic. Uh, and uh, we also found, using the same uh, evidence, that humans were adapted to hunt larger animals, so specialized in larger animals. One example I can give is the acidity. So we have very high acidity compared to other, uh, other animals. Uh, we have actually the acidity of scavengers. So even a higher acidity than carnivores. And the, the only explanation I could come up with is that we, when we hunt, we are hunting differently. We bring the prey into our place and we protect it and we sit on it. So we sit on it for a week, two weeks. In the meantime, it rots and we need the protection uh, against pathogens that the acidity provides. So evidence like that shows us that we are adapted to specialize in large animals. I'll skip that one too. So let's see what happened to large animals during the Paleolithic. So this is, we did this work uh, in, 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 on, on, uh, uh, on the record, the final record of Israel and, and the neighbors, so very close, and there's a good, good uh, archeology span there. So took about 70 or so sites archaeological sites, calculate the average size of the prey, and as you can see, it goes down and down and down and down, until we end up with the gazelle as the dominant animal, uh, 25 kilos, and then even younger gazelles that don't, don't have any fat. So really, like, people become desperate uh, at the end. So this is in the Levant. Uh, in Africa, 2018, on science, uh, Felisa Smith and their group came up with, a, with an interesting, uh, even deeper view of, of what happened to uh, large animals. They showed that animals became larger and larger and larger over, over 65 million years uh, since the extinction of the dinosaurs. And they reached about 500 kilo average this is terrestrial mammals, 500 kilo average, uh, about two and a half million years ago. And today, it's about 10 kilos. So a drastic decline that happened during the reign of human as a caretaker of the environment. Uh, and I did some studies, some, some, uh, some, some 
checks myself on, on certain situations worldwide. These are just two. And this is Africa on the left side, Africa uh, 300,000 years ago. And on the right side is Europe 50,000 years ago. Both places, you see a decline in prey size as, the, as Homo sapiens appear. So in any case, we feel that we have quite a good uh, uh, proof, let's say, or, or strengthening the, the hypothesis that there was a prey size decline that didn't start only in the late quaternary megafauna extinction, which is agreed upon, which well, started about 50,000 years ago, but it started much, much more earlier. So that led us to uh, tie the two things. We were carnivores, we were uh, specialized in large prey, prey size declined. So this can explain, must explain, a lot of the phenomena that happened in prehistory. So we published this paper in Quaternary. It's not a, the best uh, journal, OK? It's, it's a new, it's, I think it's quite new journal. But we could not, uh, could not, we sent it to Nature. They said that there's no advance in science in, in our paper. So they rejected it. Uh, but anyway, we published it. Uh, and but before, before I continue, I just want to say something about a, a unifying hypothesis, OK? Uh, we are here, actually, because of a unifying hypothesis. Because uh, the mismatch theory or the evolutionary actually explain many phenomena. Just one cause explains many phenomena. So you have a unifying hypothesis. So it's interesting to see, to look at, into unifying hypotheses. So two examples. One on the left is a guy by the name of Emanuel Velikovsky, who was a psychiatrist and psychologist, and wrote a book in the 40s called World in Collision, and managed to sell quite a lot of uh, copies. And his claim was that cosmic collisions explain biblical phenomena. So this is, of course, complete baloney. Uh, <laughs> The, com the, the cosmic collision didn't happen, uh, and the biblical phenomena, in my opinion, didn't happen either. So, <laughs> so it's complete baloney. Uh, on the, on the right-hand side, you have uh, Alfred Wegener, whose name is not so familiar, but he should be, uh, who, who was one of the first people to come up with the tectonic plate movement as explaining, as explaining uh, geological events. By the time he was vindicated at the beginning of the 60s, he was dead for 40 years, unfortunately. So you have, the, you can put the, the, all, all the hypotheses on this scale. On the right side, you have unanimously accepted hypotheses. On the left side, you have unanim unanimously rejected hypotheses. And in the middle, you have a soup of all hundreds of hypotheses that are moving left and right. And some of them are not moving because people ignore them. Uh, but, but if you look into them, now, I didn't do it, but this my, my uh, belief is that you will find very few uh, unifying hypotheses. And why is that? First of all, it's very difficult to come up with them. Because you need one source to explain many things. Uh, it's, it's much easier to explain one thing with one thing. So uh, Kitcher, who is a philosopher of science, uh, says that to explain is to fit the phenomena into unified pictures insofar as we can. So the, the more unified, the more phenomena you explain, the better uh, the hypothesis as far as he's concerned. Another uh, uh, approach is this Karl Popper where uh, he says that better uh, hypotheses are the more refutable ones. So there's no more refutable hypothesis than a unifying hypothesis, because you have many areas that can be attacked. OK? So it's a better from Karl Popper point of view as well. And another, another argument, I would say, is that the association of one factor with many phenomena strengthen the causality. So it's always a problem, because we only talk about associations, and then we can explain them a little bit mechanically. But uh, association will always tell associations. And the causality, 
I think is the probability of causality is improved when you have one that explains many phenomena. And the last one is maybe unique a little bit to, to, the, to, to my hypothesis here, is that the new unidirectionality, as I will show you, a lot of the phenomena in the prehistory are unidirectional, like the brain size increase. Okay, it increased and increased and increased. In the late, in the late stage, it declined a little bit, but, but uh, over two million years, it decreased. And you have an explanation by something that also has directional. So the prey decline is also directional. So if you have many phenomena that are directional explained by something directional, it's a little bit like dose response in pharmacology. So it strengthens the, the, the causality uh, of the Another, uh, some other criteria that scientists use to judge a hypothesis is uh, simple, like Oxnabrazor, uh, unified, explanatory, beautiful, elegant, harmonious, etc., etc. I leave you to judge uh, whether that is applicable here. So one, one example of directionality that is not so obvious, and actually nobody wrote about it uh, before, is the changing of cultures. So the f first culture that we see is called older one, and this is associated with Homo habilis, very simple stone tools, it lasted about a million years. And the second culture is uh, the Ashelian, and by the way, it was worldwide. In other words, all over the world, you could see the same culture, the same stone tools. Uh, Ashelian was also worldwide and lasted for about a million and a half associated with Homo erectus, which, by the way, is my favorite uh, species. <laughs> and, uh, and then prey size decline began in earnest. And 300,000 years ago, it appears another culture called the Musterian in Europe. It's called the Middle Stone Age in Africa. It's called Middle Paleolithic in other places. But ba basically, it's the same, it's the same culture. Uh, so it's worldwide, but it lasted only 250 years. The, ne the next cultures, which are all under the envelope of uh, upper what's called Upper Paleolithic, already start to last ten tens of thousands of years, and then single thousands of years, and they become much, much more localized. So you have a directionality of shorter cultures and more localized cultures. So let's start with the, counting the phenomena that we can explain. So this is the cause, obtaining effect for smaller prey, uh, and the need, uh, it's not in here, but the need to compensate energetically, and this ties up with Stephanie, uh, presentation yesterday uh, to cope up energetically with the extra load that smaller animals uh, inflict on, on you when you get together. So brain we discussed, the tracking, but there are other things as well. Language. Language is a good one because the unique property of language in comparison to like talking with your face and, and hands, uh, uh, is that you can convey, and this is not my idea, it's, it's somebody else, you can convey uh, events that took place somewhere else at a different time. So if you want to tell somebody that you saw an elephant in uh, this and this lake yesterday morning, it's very difficult to do it with sign language. So you have to do it, you have to start to employ a uh, language, but not only that. If you want to do good tracking, you need to ac accumulate a lot of information about nature. And you give to name, Hadza know hundreds of names for the birds in this, their territory, for the insects in their territory. They know if the insects are nocturnal or they're active during the day. They know a lot. And just to accumulate this knowledge and to retain it, you need language. And to transfer it to the next generation, you need language. So language was important to cope, and it, it makes you more energetically efficient when hunting smaller animals. 
uh, non-sapient extinction, uh, this is like, a, the good example is Neanderthal. On this extinction, I did my PhD. Again, it's, it's a, he actually succumbed to the decline in prey size. He just couldn't cope with it energetically. I won't go into the details, but uh, that's another. Faunal extinction is a, is a, was helped by the need to obtain fat. So you need larger animals or you hunt uh, prime adults, as we'll see a little bit later, uh, or, or you exploit part of the animals. Sometimes you see signs that people just exploit the fatty parts of the animal. These three things actually make animals more suspicious or more vulnerable uh, when, when climate uh, 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 change uh, force them, uh, uh, you know, make another pressure on them. So, so the need for more fat actually caused uh, uh, animals to be more vulnerable to extinction. Uh, fire is another point. I think, Stephanie, I don't remember if you'd made it, that we use, we use instead of only the power of the, of the food or the caloric value of the food, we use also external means to, to help us with the energy. So fire was the first one. If we just collect some wood, not, not oil, but wood, and uh, we use energy outside of our, uh, so it becomes more effective. And uh, so we can extract more energy from uh, meat and from, from plant food as well. So fire can also be explained by the need to be more efficient energetically. Tools, tools go down in size. It's also a directional phenomenon. And it's also, you see that how they adapted to hunt smaller and smaller animals. So you get stone tips uh, that you put on a spear, and then you get stone tips that you put on bow and arrow, which go, go further after smaller animals. Uh, so again, a directional uh, uh, phenomena. Uh, behavior, like sharing, uh, others, I won't go into it, but again, can be explained a lot of it, a lot of the changes can be explained as adaptation to hunt smaller animals. Homo sapiens, okay, we talked about the brain increase, uh, size increase, but there are other morphological changes in, hom in uh, Homo sapiens that allow them to run faster and all that stuff, that also adaptation to hunting smaller animals. Uh, culture changes, okay, we discussed that. Uh, large fauna, okay, just the need to obtain fat uh, 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 can, be, can explain large fauna in, in, in the archaeological sites. We discussed that. Prime adults, uh, obtaining prime adults is a crazy uh, strategy for a predator because it's much easier to, to catch younger animals and it's much easier to catch older animals. So why would a predator uh, choose to catch just part of the population, already like decreasing his chances of meeting an animal by maybe a half, uh, and uh, uh, the only reason is fat that I could come up with. Uh, prime adults are always fatter than other animals, than other ages, age groups. Uh, upper Paleolithic, okay, we started to discuss it, but the Upper Paleolithic uh, major change that you can see is increasing the consumption of plants. So this is a reaction to the fat disappearance that happens when prey size start to decline. Dogs. Dogs are a good, very good example of uh, energetically, effectively uh, uh, hunting smaller prey because they run for you. Yeah? <laughs> and by the way, you can feed dogs with the protein that you cannot metabolize yourself because, uh, you know, lions and, and, and wolves uh, can metabolize 80% of their, of their energy from protein, no problem. And last but not least is the uh, uh, moving to, ag to agriculture, uh, uh, where, where you get more energy from, if you need non-protein, okay, we need 65% to come from non-protein. When large animals completely disappear or very strongly disappear, then then you, you sit down and you raise your own uh, 
you own. So, uh, so all of them, all of them, apart from this final uh, extinction, which is uh, all of them can be explained energetically. Okay. So I'm an economist. In, in economy, you follow the money if you want to understand things. In in uh, in biology, you follow energy. And and this is why I think this explanation is neat. Uh, also, the the most of the phenomena are directional. Okay, so this also I think uh, 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 strengthens the the association. So that, with that I finish the introduction. But I want to say how, why why it's, uh, why it's actually relevant to us. So I think one one uh, point is very obvious, is that. Fat and meat are, you know, natural to us, and, and it's a food that we consume a lot of, and we adapted uh, very nicely to it. The second one is maybe not so obvious, but, but still. The fact that we see a lot of uh, behavior to, to, to catch fat, okay, to hunt fat, maybe the fat hunter, means that we were at the at the limit of the protein consumption. So for 2 million years, my belief is that we consumed 30, 35% of our diet from protein. So protein power to make it, make it 